You're joining All Things College and Career for in-depth stories and advice with your hosts, Meg Gary and Bobby Ryan, owners of Academic and Career Advising Services. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are so excited and honored today to share our interview with Dr. Nancy Schlossberg. Bobby and I consider her to be an icon in this space of career development, adult transitions, adults as learners in intergenerational relationships. Absolutely. We consider her an icon and anyone in this field does as well, for sure. Nancy is amazing. She shares in our interview that she is 92 years young and is still recovering from a bad case of COVID, but she still came on our podcast, which just shows her resiliency. She looks incredible and is excited to get to work on her next project, which you will hear about on the podcast today. Yeah, just incredible. Nothing is slowing her down. And just a little background on Nancy. She has written many, many books, including Too Young to Be Old, Love, Learn, Work and Play as You Age, and the fifth edition of the textbook that she co-authored with Jane Goodman and Mary L. Anderson on Counseling Adults in Transition will be released this fall of 2021. Mm -hmm. And I just finished Too Young to Be Old. Excellent book. Anybody that's interested in transitioning in retirement or even, you know, I'm not even ready for that, but it's still a great book to read at any age. So Nancy has delivered over 100 keynote addresses. She has been on PBS and she has been featured or cited or quoted on many other national media outlets. She is the former president of the NCDA and is Professor Emerita at the University of Maryland, but also served on the faculties at Wayne State University, Howard University, and the Pratt Institute. So yeah, I mean, we could go on and on with her bio, but we're going to wrap it up there. And let's get on to our interview with Dr. Nancy Schlossberg. Okay, let's do it. Welcome, Dr. Nancy Schlossberg. Thank you so much for doing our podcast today. We are so honored and excited to have you. I'm delighted to be here. We can't believe we have you. We feel like we have a celebrity on today. I have to show you that I'm reading this book right here, Too Young to Be Old. (laughs) Absolutely. And and Dr. Schlossberg has another one that's about to be released in the fall. I don't know if you want to mention that. You're re-releasing the transitions works oh I, but the textbook yes oh t- I'm thinking I, I haven't written a new book um, yeah. yeah no the textbook is coming out and that, that's kind of interesting years ago I wrote the first edition single author then after that I invited Jane Goodman and Ellie Waters to join me and then after that We invited Mary Anderson and Jane and I, and I kind of dropped to third author because (laughs) I do less of the work. My passion has changed a little bit. And and if you want me to tell you about that, I will. But I'm very committed to that book. And it was also interesting. At the time that I was thinking about a textbook back in the 80s, I also wanted to write a more popular book. So in the mid eighties, I don't even have the date of the first edition in my head, but the textbook came out and my first trade book that is not with an educational publisher was overwhelmed coping with life's ups and downs. And it's the same book, only one is written for people overwhelmed with life and how they can cope with transitions and the other is geared for professionals. And let me just say that Mary Anderson and Jane Goodman have turned the textbook into something much better than uh, my original. So they have really enhanced it, but it's the same content. It's the same concepts, but it's for a very different population. So when you said to me, I was coming out with a book. I thought, how marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> I have to write it. 
Oh, goodness. Well, just so our listeners know, it's the fifth edition of Counseling Adults in Transition about to be re-released in the fall of 2021. And you're so modest to give all the credit to the other (laughs) authors, but I am sure they owe a lot of tribute to the foundation you laid. Yeah, well, you know, it was very exciting in the period of developing the transition model theory, whatever you want to call it. And uh, as I look back, I cannot believe I did it because I was raising two children, working full time, a busy life. Mm. And I feel like the thought of it makes it exhaust me. Uh, yeah, I know. You can't imagine how you did all you did with two kids running around and uh, yeah, well, good for you. And I'm, and we're glad you did this work because it's important work and a lot of people use your work today. So absolutely. You mentioned you're more interested in other things now. So I didn't want to let that go without hearing about that. Well, I'm most interested since I retired in translating my work for people. In other words, I'm thrilled that my work and others, our work is being given and distributed to professionals. But then what about all the people going through transitions? Mm -hmm. I made a big decision several years ago when I was writing the last book, Too Young to Be Old. I was looking for a publisher and I don't self-publish and I'll tell you why. If I ever write a memoir, that would be self-published. But as a counseling psychologist, if I self-publish, I could write anything I want. I could make things up. Whereas Mm. if you have a publisher, you're vetted. And I thought in this field, we need vetting. So I was looking for a publisher and a very fine publisher came back and offered me a contract but they wanted it to be twice as long and a much more expensive book. And I remember thinking, if I don't accept this contract, getting published is hard. Very hard, yeah. Maybe I'll never be able to publish it. So I thought, and then I wrote the following letter and thanked them and said, my mission right now is to write paperback books that are like in the $20 range so that people can buy them. And so I declined it. And then I had published two books with the American Psychological Association. And I thought they're never gonna publish a third, but I sent it to them and they did. And that's that. But I made my mind up that my commitment was to try to translate whatever I have learned from all the people I've interviewed, all the people I've worked with to turn it so that people can benefit. Yeah. But that wasn't, I mean, I'm very committed to the profession, but I also in later years wanted to translate my work. I love that to the lay person and to the everyday person that really needs this help and guidance. I love that. So. Yeah, and we have a big population going into the retirement years. Oh, yeah. And it's a confusing time. It's a scary time and getting good information and good help. Everybody needs it. There's so many things in your book that I've been enjoying. And you know, I'm not in my retirement years yet, but they're coming. <laughs> and when they come, you want to be prepared. You want to have thought about this. I mean, in one of your videos, you asked the audience a series of questions about being prepared for retirement and how many of you were able to answer yes to these. And I think you had one person that could answer yes to all of them. And most people, most people just aren't prepared. And so what are some of the things people should be doing to prepare for retirement? Well, first of all, a lot of people aren't going to prepare early because they're in denial. And I was certainly that way. I loved my work and I was very, very busy. The last thing I had time for was a retirement workshop. Uh, I talked to a financial planner to see if what I could afford and how much money, what would happen to my money. Because you go through paycheck withdrawal syndrome when, Mm. when, you know, it's, it's too used to a paycheck. So, I was in denial, but a lot of people are, and they really don't have the time, energy, or interest. For those who do, it's wonderful. But for those who don't, 
then I say to counselors and financial planners and career coaches, you make available opportunities for people to deal with that when they are ready to deal with it. There's nothing, I mean, it's great if you can prepare early. For example, when I interviewed, I don't know which of the retirement books, but as you know, I have two retirement books Mm -hmm. um, that are paperback and available. So I interviewed a lot of people. One of the men was a reporter for a major newspaper. And the day he retired, the next day, his life changed and he had planned it out. He had turned his garage into a studio. He considered himself a painter artist. And that's what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. And he set it up. And when I interviewed, I said, well, how do you want to be designated painter, artist, what? He said, not yet, not until I have a one-man show. Then I'll consider myself an artist. And he did. But he knew exactly what he wanted to do, where so many people are stumbling around and don't know what they're going to do. So. Yeah. Your question is what you want to know. What yeah. They- so what should people be thinking of to prepare for retirement? And also, once you get there, what are the things you can expect to feel or encounter? Well, I think one of, I like to give people a sense of excitement. Mm-hmm. We're living longer. So we've got more years where we won't be working it the way we did now. What can you do? That's why I developed the paths through interviews to realize that you have a lot of possible paths Mm -hmm. and you're not on a retirement path, the same one forever. And if you'd like, we can just quickly review the paths. I would love that. Yeah. Well, the first is a continuer. I am clearly a continuer. Yeah. I I don't work as much as I did. I mean, I I just don't. Although during the pandemic, I really did because so many people needed help developing Zoom retirement programs. Mm. So that that was really fun to do and interesting. But I'm not working the way I did in retirement. But during the 20 or so years I've been retired, I've been a continuer. I've modified. I don't teach. Uh, I don't have a salary. I have income withdrawal syndrome, but it's all within the field of counseling with a special emphasis on career counseling. That's been one of my themes. So I'm a continuer. Now, this is the question. I am 92 years old. For our listeners, you look incredible. Amazing. You look amazing. You have better skin than I do. I know. <laughs> it's we'll have to talk beauty secrets later. Yes. <laughs> so, I'm a continuer. Yeah. I'm 92 years old. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to get hired to give the keynote speeches I used to give. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to get hired to do a lot of the things I did. And I don't even want to do all the things I did. So now what happens to me? I go on a new path, the searcher, because all of us are going to be searchers trying to figure out our niche. You might do it just when you retire. I'm doing it 20 years later in the, probably the last decade of my life. And what can I do with the short amount of time left for me that can be of help? to both the profession and people. And I don't have the answer. You are the career coaches. You will give me the answer at the end of the program, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm taking notes and... (laughs) Oh, goodness. I'm trying to figure out my life from now on. So I'm using myself as an illustration that you, you don't have to wait till the end of your life to be a searcher. You might retire and trying to figure out what do I want to do. So you search, you think, you interview people, you look around, but we will all be searchers several different times in our lives. Mm -hmm. 
There's another possible path. I wish, I wish it were me. This path is the one I'm envious of. Easy glider. Easy yeah. glider doesn't worry about a career, about just lets the day unfold, babysits if that's needed, volunteers for something, whatever. But I'm not an easy glider, never have been. So that that path isn't open. But it is for many people. Yeah. And, uh, I know a woman, her biggest joy is babysitting. Mm-hmm. So if they call her to babysit, she wants to be free to babysit yeah. for her grandchildren. At any rate, I, I'm trying to illustrate that there, there, and there's no set time to be an easy glider. It's a personality thing. But okay, so then continuer, searcher, easy glider. Involves spectator. Yeah, there are a lot of people. I met a group of, of uh, retired museum directors, and they no longer were working in museums, but they were still involved as a spectator in the art world. And I've known people in politics who, when they retire from politics, they are still so involved. They're news junkies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so somebody said after I mentioned this at a talk, well, now I know what to put on my card. <laughs> right. uh, yes, oh. because people will ask you when you retire. So what do you what do you do? Yeah. Or, what are you like, doing? Yeah. 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 Now, the one that, that a lot of people are do is they're adventurers. Now, I don't mean that you're going to go mountain climbing. Or go to the South Sea Islands, but it means that you're going to do something you have never done before. So it doesn't have to be dramatic and exciting. It's just different. Yeah. And I'll tell you a story, and this is uh, quite different. Interviewed a man, a delightful man, who had worked for Congress. He had headed up a research project. He had a lot of people. Uh, working for him, but uh, Congress voted to do away with this project. So he, in his very late 50s, early 60s, was without a job, Hmm. and he really didn't know what to do. He remembered, when he was much younger, the death of of a child, and he remembered how upset he was. And what helped him was a massage therapist. And he remembered that. He also remembered that he went on a sailing trip afterwards to recover. Now, he had more children. He was married. But he went on the sailing trip alone to think through what he should do with his life. And then Mm -hmm. what he realized was that massage therapist really helped me. Maybe that's what I want to do. Hmm. So he comes back, and here he had been, you know, the suit and tie and brief. Yeah. And he announces to his family he's going to massage therapy school. I mean, his, everybody was a little bit shocked. He did go, and then he found that he, he needed more than just giving massages, and he became involved in the running of the school. He since died. After he died and one of the, I forget which retirement book talked about him. It could have been the first one, Retire Smart, Retire Happy, or Revitalizing Retirement. Um, after he died, his wife wrote to me, and she said she knew I had interviewed him and wrote about him, and she could not read the book, but recently she had the courage. And when she reread about him, she was so proud of him that he could do with his life what he wanted to do, even though it wasn't conforming to what all of his peer group would have done. So there is a big adventurer, but a little adventurer, a a house husband, a housewife, who becomes a docent in a museum or gets into uh, conservation. I mean, there's so many possibilities (laughs) Right. And often these can lead to paid possibilities. But really the way to approach it is 
to think, what do I want to learn about that I have never learned about? What would be exciting to work on? So the adventure path could be exciting to pursue. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, how many paths have I given? I think the only one you're missing is the retreater. Retreater. Yeah. And it's more complicated than it sounds. A retreater, uh, in one way, is somebody who just becomes a couch potato and really get, <laughs> becomes depressed because yeah. he or she cannot figure out what to do with life. Mm -hmm. And... I think we've all seen that people mm -hmm. complain about a lot of people, adult children complain about their parents just sitting around and not being engaged anymore. Right. That's one kind of retreater. Then there is a retreater who is taking a moratorium, stepping back, breathing, and thinking about life, who will then re-enter the world. But I'm the kind of retreater who becomes a couch potato. I, I remember interviewing a man actually owned a cleaning establishment in Washington, D.C. Lovely man. A lot of us who lived in that area always took our clothes there and uh, we knew him. And then he and his, he and his wife retired. And we never saw them again. Well, except that I interviewed him. I did see him again. And what happened to him, his adult son became very concerned about his father, who's sitting around moping, depressed. Mm. Mm. And the son remembered that the father loved baseball. And the son found a baseball, senior baseball group and took his father, and his father became very involved in the baseball group. So, okay. I mean, there are great possibilities. I just have to tell you this little sidebar. I did a little piece once about adult children hiring their parents. Ah. You think mm -hmm. of adult children, they're worry warts over their parents. Right. Uh, they were, what are you doing? You shouldn't go out in the pandemic, you shouldn't do this, you should do that. And they they begin, they love their parents and they want their parents to live, so they become supervisors. Mm. I'm, trying teach, I'm trying to teach the old people I know not to lie to your adult children, but you don't have to tell them everything. <laughs> because during the pandemic, they were unbelievable. You can't go out, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, right. at, at any rate, we have adult children who have hired their parents. And this was really interesting to me. My computer guru, and my son says I should stop paying him, that that's his whole inheritance has gone to the <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, has been with me for years because I'm always in a crisis, a computer crisis. And then when his father retired, what was his father going to do? Mm. So his father goes to every house call with Daniel. And he does some of the phoning, appointments, billing. And it's given his father a new lease on life. And for Daniel, he can trust his father. And it's a good situation. Then there was a young woman who had a PR, a boutique PR company. And she hired her mother and her mother mm -hmm. set up photo shoots. And I interviewed both. And it really is a win-win situation. I wrote the little piece, give your parent a raise. So <laughs> I, I, said to, I said to my son, you know, I'm writing the story about adult children who hire their parents. What do you think of that as an idea? Said you're way too expensive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't afford you, Mom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I never got a job for my son. But anyway, uh, there are all of these possibilities. But each time, you kind like I mean, you'll have to interview me next year to see what have I come up with. But I definitely, yeah, let's put that on the calendar for sure. <laughs>
Uh, One of the things that you talked about is that if you've had some regrets in your life, then maybe in retirement, that might be a time where you can try to revisit them. And Nancy will talk to us about some of those regrets you may have had during your life and what you can do about them during retirement right after this short message from Meg. Thank you, Bobby. I just wanted to quickly break in here to share. I am now an FCD instructor. So if you would like to become a certified career counselor through the NCDA, I can now make that happen for you. I also offer career coaching and academic advising. To learn more about any of these services, please visit my website, Academic and Career Advising Services. I will include that link in the show notes. Now back to the podcast. Yes. And I do say that, and it is true, but people say, well, I don't have time to do this or that. I don't have time. I like to think about a piece of the grain. You don't have to have the whole grain. If you've always dreamt about becoming a farmer, you're not maybe at the age of 60 going to suddenly buy a farm. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But is there a piece of it? Is there something in that? or in the field of music or whatever field that you pick, is there something, some piece of it that you can grab onto? Right. Uh, I do think of my daughter now when she was 30, she was a school teacher, an art teacher. And for her 30th birthday, I said, do you want a party? What do you want? Well, I had just written the book going to plan B. I don't know if you know that, but that's the book about Mm -hmm. Mm non-events. And um, unfortunately, it's out of print. That was a Simon & Schuster book. But it was all about the expectations and dreams you had that have not come true. Right. So she said she didn't want a party. She said, I should have been the centerpiece of, of your book. I don't have the husband I wanted, oh. where I wanted, the life I wanted at 30. Hmm. And I just can't have a party. So I felt terrible for her. And yeah. Yeah. so I thought about it and I said, well, think about a piece of the dream. You can't invent the husband or the children, but you could sell your condominium and look for a little piece of property, a little farmette. That's what she did. She took a piece of it. Now, many years later, she's got the husband, she's got the children, she's got the goat. She's a goat farmer, a fiber artist. So it's a Love piece it. of it. And, but that was a 30-year-old. That So you you can retire at different times. You don't have to be old to retire. Yes. So I, 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 I think of that as a, as a nice way to think about life. You regret, yeah. And you don't want regrets because we all maybe have some regrets, but what what piece of it can we do something about? Hmm. Yeah, I love that because often when you think of like, for me, you know, I had dreams of going to medical school years ago. And obviously I'm not going to go to medical school, <laughs> but, <laughs> but maybe someday, right, you can take a part of that, a bit of that, and maybe you're helping people in some capacity and that kind of fulfills that part of your regret. Well, or- well look, you love uh, technology and mm-hmm. developing products mm-hmm. and you should be doing products for older people that would help them be more mobile or I don't know what. Yeah. But- those things. Right. Yeah. So I just like your idea that you don't, you don't have to fulfill the exact expectation that grabbing part of it may be very fulfilling in itself. Yeah. Yeah. When I think of career planning, it, there's not an inventory or a test you can take that'll come up and say, you really should do X, Y, and Z. It just right. isn't going to work that way. Right. Uh, and you can combine pads. You can be an adventurer uh, while you're searching. I mean, you it's its not cut and dry, but it is a little different approach than a career inventory with your identifying your interests. Yeah. Which is important too. Right. I love that. And a quote you had, I have to uh, share with our listeners that I heard you say is, 
career counseling goes all through life, birth to death. That's true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And which is exciting for the field. It's a very important field. For the field. So for today's career counselors, do you have anything that you think career counselors today should really be concerned with or focusing on? Well, the obvious diversity, different styles, Mm -hmm. uh, bias. Uh, Oh, many years ago, one of the first studies in age bias, and we know it's there, it's alive and well. Mm -hmm. And then now the new popular bias, I mean, we have about all kinds of groups black, ethnic, I mean, uh, Asian, I mean, you name it. Right. There are stereotypes and we categorize people. Now, of all people who should be free of categorizing and of bias, it's career counselors. Yes. But one of my first studies with John Petrofesso, we were both at Wayne State and we did, we, this is now in the 60s in the late 60s. Yep. And we did something you're not allowed to do. We had counselors in training thinking they were being interviewed in a legitimate way, but it was really for research. Well, now you can't do that. You have to <laughs> right. fully disclose. So we took the question, should I go into engineering or education? Mm-hmm. And looked at, so we, we uh, trained, not trained, but we, we got people who pretended that that was what their question was. Then we got all these counselors in training who didn't know we were studying them. And they think they're talking to a real client who is debating. And now, again, this is in the late 60s. So, and guess what? All these counselors were pushing them to edu- the women to education. Of not course. Right. Yeah. Well, that that was in the I guess the very late sixties, and Mondale then was heading up a committee, and we went. They asked us to testify, and we talked about it. I'm and, assuming you mean Walter Mondale. Yeah. Right. So during the hearings, this was I guess well, this was probably 1970. And we were just going to be moving back from Detroit, back to Washington. And he asked about this study where the counselors didn't know the truth, the whole truth. And I said, why do you think I'm leaving Detroit? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's interesting. My dad wanted, he had six daughters and he wanted all of us to be engineers. Bobby is one. (laughs) And, uh, I think, well, Bobby, you can share how many women were in your engineering class. Yeah, I believe we had, I I think we had four, but I don't know how many we graduated with. Out of, we started with 300 in our major. And And I think, yeah, 300 total. And then I think four of us were women, but I I don't know how many of us made it to graduation. So, but uh, yeah, it, it was small. It, it was a small class for sure. Small class of women, but yeah, not a lot of women went into engineering and more do now, but. Um, well, what, what prompted you? What, what was the tipping point? Okay. When I was coming up to my senior year in high school, I was thinking about medicine, but that was daunting at 18. That's daunting because it's so many years of school. And even though it appealed to me, I have to say it was daunting to think about going to school that long. And so I liked math and science. So my dad said, you know, how about engineering, you know? And I said, all right, yeah, I'll give that a shot. So I started as an electrical engineer and did not like that, but switched to mechanical engineering where everything's, it's a physical engineering. You know, you can see what you're designing and I loved that. So he wasn't wrong, but I think it's just because I was a math science kid. I didn't really like writing the papers and studying. Although you're good at that. But. <laughs> uh, I mean, you have to be to, to, to communicate yeah. well in this world, right? But yeah, yeah. Absolutely. so that's how that happened. I'd be curious how many people of your generation, women, have their doctorate's degree as you do. Mm. Well, 
um, I think, you know, during the time that I was raising children and working, I didn't realize how unusual I was. But I will tell <laughs> yeah. you, it's even, I think, not just how many doctors, but how many in the 70s were full tenured professors. Not yeah. But here's why I had the career I had. First of all, I was lucky that my first marriage to a very nice man did not work out and I didn't get pregnant. Mm -hmm. So therefore I didn't have children in my twenties. Right. And therefore went on and got a doctorate. So that by the time I was 30, I had a doctorate and then I met the man, I, uh, my husband for almost 50 years, father of my children. So by the time I was in my thirties, and we had children, we could afford help. Yeah. Because if you did all that in your 20s, you're you know, dead broke. Yeah. <laughs> here, here was the critical story. And you yeah. tell me if this could happen today. This must have been 1967, 68. And my husband was older than I. And we were living in Detroit because my husband had an opportunity, he was a labor lawyer on the side of workers, and you're too young to have known the name Walter Ruther, who was one of the great civil rights leaders of our country. Mm -hmm. and he also was the president of the United Automobile Workers, a wonderful union, and that, I don't know what it is today. So Walter Ruther wanted my husband to come and be his general counsel. And I remember saying, well, you can't do that because I have this job at Howard University. I'd just gotten my degree, and now I was the assistant director of the counseling center. And you'll see later, Steve was a great feminist, but he said, Nancy, there is one Walter Ruther, and there are many universities. Mm. An opportunity for both. There's an opportunity, yeah. So we go to Detroit, and a lot of wonderful stories that we don't have time for. But I now have a low level job at Wayne State as an assistant professor. Or I wasn't I wasn't even on the tenure track. I mean, I was in the Department of Counseling, but I I, I mean, it was very nothing. I was just beginning. Steve, of course, is meeting with the president of the United States on this issue and that issue and representing labor. So he's got a major job and I do not. And I'm yeah. too old. So I say, Steve, I'm going to quit my job at Wayne. I cannot handle the household. I cannot handle raising children. I cannot handle preparing for class. Steve Schlossberg said, you cannot resign. If you leave your job, you will be a woman in and out of the labor market. You will never have the career you should have. Mm -hmm. We are in this together. Mm. And that is, now, even today, I don't know that all men would say that to their wives. Yeah. So I don't know either. I mean, it sounds like you have a keeper. <laughs> well, I, did. I did. And, yeah. um, so he was quite extraordinary, and he fought for women's issues uh, in terms of legislation. But when it came to personal things, he really believed that my life was just as important as his, and that my career was just as important as his. I so, think the only other person I can think of that would say the same right off the top of my head was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She, she said the same. I think you and Ruth have something in common there. <laughs> yeah. There were so many people had said that mm -hmm. because Marty, her husband, was, I mean, and Steve, busy as he was, if he was going on a trip to Europe, he made sure there was food. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, he, so nice. He and, 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 and he was, we shared things together and that, that made life easier. But I do also think uh Delaying having children, I'm not suggesting that that's the answer, but for me, it worked. Right. I also, before Betty Friedan wrote her book, I also had a vision about. That's not a fem. That's a book on feminism. I'm 
I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So at any rate, I was lucky. We're all influenced by history, by the, the generation we're a part of. But when I was doing all this, I did not see it as groundbreaking. I really didn't. Until sort of looking back now, I think, my gosh, it really was unusual. Sure and was. I once said to my daughter, the farmer, and she's still <laughs> a farmer, she, uh, she does the most beautiful wool. She goes to places mm. like Linebeck for her wool from her Angora goats. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing the work mm. she does. But um, I once said to her when she was about 15, should I have felt guilty that I worked? And by the way, I did not feel guilty. <laughs> and I, I didn't feel guilty. I don't know why. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I did not. That's a gift, guilty. yeah. <laughs> so I said, should I have felt guilty? And she said, no, it's lucky you worked. You're enough of the Jewish mother as it is. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't have handled yeah. you full time at home, Mom. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Love that. So she was not damaged by it, but is the bottom okay. line. Maybe I, a little relieved by it. <laughs> on the other hand, she is much more traditional than I mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, her life. You know, mm -hmm. she was a stay at home. What she wanted to do was to leave work, be a stay-at-home mom, develop her fiber mm -hmm. art. And so she, she took a different path. And I do remember I was at, at the Bank Street College of Education in New York giving a speech. And Karen I was about 15 then, and she came to New York with me. And we then Steve for a little holiday. And she came with me while I made the speech and somebody came up to her and said, well, something about having a mother who's uh, works and achieves. And I mean, they said something and yeah. Karen said, but well, I'm a different person than my mother. Mm -hmm. And I was so proud of her. Yes. You know, she, she has her own life and followed her own path. Right. Yeah, well, part, part of the reason she felt comfortable doing it is obviously because you encourage people to find their own paths and do yeah. their own thing. And, you know, what better role mm. model than you, really? I can't let you go before we just talk a little bit about transition theory, because that's somewhat what you're famous for. I teach it in my course all the time uh, to any, you know, to people I'm helping to become certified career services providers because as CSPs, we're always helping people through transition, whether they're going from high school to college, college to a job, job to job, or changing majors. So I didn't know if you had any advice for us. Obviously, you talk about the four S's, the situation, self, support, and strategies. I think uh, one thing I love about your work is how practical, the practical aspect of it, how you can really use it. Well, uh, if we have the time, I'd like to ask you what you find the most useful in your coaching and counseling of the theory, and then I'll tell you. What I find helpful is that you can look at each of these and to see which one is really lacking, which one is m missing, and that's perhaps what's really weighing them down and where they're really struggling. Well, the focus with an individual, sometimes you're focusing on their resources for coping, which are the four S's. But sometimes you're helping people understand why they are so upset. Even if it's a transition they yeah. want. Why you just got the promotion, you just got the big house, the new house, or the new baby, and why are you depressed? Because anytime there's a major change, in your roles, relationships, your day, your routines, or your assumptions, it's jarring. So there are a couple of things. One, to help people understand why transitions, good or bad, can be overwhelming. 
And that's to look at the way to compare two transitions, one that was easy, one that wasn't, and look at the degree to which their lives were changed. And don't overlook routines, because the change Mm. of routines is very important. Mm. Second, so I, I try to help people understand about transitions in that way. I also try to help people understand that the way you react to a transition at one point in time is not the way you would a hundred years later. And I look at the work Sandy Leibowitz and I did of NASA's space flight people who yes. jobs were eliminated and how undone they were at the beginning and then how it worked out later. And I often speeches, I'll start this way. I know you won't believe it, but I was jilted once. Now it's hard <laughs> to interview me. On the day of the big jilt, I would have been crying. My life was over, blah, blah, blah. It was not a month later that I met my husband. Right. So if you interviewed me a month later, and if you interview me now, the big jolt was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. So the reactions to transitions change, and you can't look at somebody at one point in time. And then the final and most important question is coping. And those are your resources, the four S's. But mm-hmm. the four S's aren't the whole story. It's the degree to which it changes your life where you are in the transition process. As you can hear, my voice is funny, but I I want your audience to know that I was vaccinated and then four months later, just about a month ago, was in the hospital with COVID. I am over COVID, I'm getting over it, but my voice does give out. Yeah. I'm here to tell you it was not a pleasant experience, but I also am working hard in physical therapy and I might mm-hmm. never be a gazelle, but I will, <laughs> I will be back to whatever normal is for me. Yes. Yes. Well, we wish you Godspeed and good health and get better soon. Absolutely. But you look fabulous and it's amazing. Amazing, Nancy. I mean, we're just so impressed by you on every level. So of course you beat COVID. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> well, I got it to people. Oh my God, did you get it? You were vaccinated. I said, I've always told you I was special. So. <laughs> I just have a couple more quick questions. Number one, who do you look up to and admire in this space? And number two, how would you like to see your work built upon? Okay, the first one, when I was at Wayne State, just beginning to look at the whole field, I discovered the work of Bernice Newgarten, who was a professor at Northwestern. And she was one of the early people writing about adult development. I decided I had to learn from her, but I'm a mother with two children and a husband. I can't go to Chicago. Mm. So I spoke to the provost or the department chair, I don't, or, or both. And I said, I wanna have a conference but I need you to support the conference the first year. And then if we raise money, we can have conferences. So I called Bernice Newgarden, a total unknown, and I introduced myself and I said, I want to have a conference about you. I want to learn from you. And I can't come to you, so I want to bring you to Detroit. So that started my conferences at both Wayne State and then the University of Maryland. And I would bring an expert I wanted to learn from. And uh, that's the way I learned. Bernice became a mentor for me. And that, well, first of all, taught me several things. You have to make things happen for yourself. And so I did. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky to have, I always had supportive bosses and chairs and deans Because if you come up with a good idea that's going to help them, they're going to support you. Right. So that was my advice is select a mentor, somebody you want to learn from. I didn't select somebody in the field of counseling 
I wanted the knowledge of adults and aging to give a the background for counselors. Mm. And then the second thing you haven't asked me about, which was really interesting, I, Jane Goodman and I, and you know the work of Jane Goodman, of course. Mm -hmm. I was just with her a little bit ago. Nice. Uh, actually, it was Jane who came to me. And we're at Wayne State. And again, I don't even know whether I was an assistant or if I was now on the tenure track, but I wasn't a professor. And she said, we have to do something about the strong vocational interest in inventory. And so both our husbands were lawyers. And Jane and I said, we'll bring a lawsuit. And our lawyer husband <laughs> said, that's not the way to go. <laughs> and so we, we did research. If there were enough women in the masculine professions to form a, a group, a norm group, and enough men, you know, if, if we looked at the norm groups. So there were enough male nurses, you know, and so forth. So we did the research. And then the American Counseling Association was then APGA. We brought a resolution. I was so nervous bringing this resolution. I must have gone to the bathroom 30 times before <laughs> we were brought yep. this resolution about the strong being biased. Mm -hmm. And so that's number one. Then a year, then we're at this professional conference, and I won't even tell you the name of the, of the person who said, so you're Nancy Schlossberg. Yeah. <laughs> you're the one that's causing all the trouble. Yeah, all the trouble. <laughs> yeah. I said, you're lucky you have me as a confronter um, rather than s some other people. Right. And then um, Campbell, David Campbell, and I were on a program, we keynoted a program and talked about whatever we talked about. And afterwards, the chair of the meeting said, could you talk about the strong and what happened? And David said, I don't, if, if Nancy, if you just called me on the phone, we, you know, instead of making the fuss you did, and I don't know that he used those words. And I said, David, if Nancy Schlossberg, assistant nothing professor at Wayne State called you to tell you that your life's work needed redoing, do you think you would have taken that seriously? Well, the whole audience broke down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you you knew how to go about it. That's That's so, an incredible story. So mm -hmm. the strong vocational interest in the joy, uh, and that was before the, uh, the development of the transition theory. So my years at Wayne were activist, where I was fighting the strong and fighting women's rights and this and that. And then when I went to Maryland, where I was for almost 30 years, that's when I got into the research and trying to understand things in a different way. So I've had several iterations to my career, activist, researcher, and I hope for many of my students, they made life good for me. And they really, they were, my students were wonderful and they taught me so much. Yeah. Well, thank you from all women for being yeah. an activist for us <laughs> way back when and paving Absolutely. the path. Absolutely. And in pointing out those differences. Amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kudos, kudos. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, so Nancy, we'd like to end our podcast with some, we're going to call quick questions, I guess, from now on, we used to call them rapid fire, but they're never rapid. So just a few, <laughs> just a few quick questions that are nothing about what we've talked about previously, but just um, get to know you a little bit better on a different level. So, okay. What would you say was your favorite vacation or trip? My favorite trip was to when I was about 29 years old and went to Turkey. Mm, and wow. To the Bosporus, stayed on the Bosporus. It was just a fabulous trip. And a later trip was Costa Rica about 10 years yeah. ago. 
Yeah, I've heard so many people say Costa Rica when 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 you ask them of one of their favorite destinations. And I haven't been to either place, so I have that traveling urge, and I'm going to get there one of these days. Okay, what food could you never give up? Artichokes. The whole artichokes. artichokes. The whole big artichokes. Oh, you like the whole thing? Great, yeah, that's a great yeah. answer. I love those- that. Oh unexpected and awesome it makes me think of my sister kathy who makes those so well with the butter and oh man. yeah so uh, good. hungry right now okay <laughs> are you a are you a good dancer oh my god now this is the tragedy of my life <laughs> <laughs> um, we used to dance a lot at get togethers when i was growing up and i loved dancing and then i married my husband Mm-hmm. Oh. It's klutz in the world. <laughs> he, he walked on the dance floor. So he was terrible, and I always felt cheated. And, uh, then Steve dies, and I meet a man, mm-hmm. Ron, and we be, we live together actually right. until it's wonderful. Um, and Ron was a terrific dancer. Ooh. But, but by this time. I had broken my leg. I oh. had a donated leg. I had this compromise. My leg was compromised. And I, he had to sort of drag me around the oh. And I felt that this was life was so unfair. I finally got it. Yeah. That is kind of a tragedy. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> well, darn it. <laughs> thank, thank goodness you had so many other wonderful things to compensate. Yeah, yeah. for sure. For sure. Okay. So if you can't sleep in the middle of the night, what do you do? Well, if I really can't sleep, I go into the kitchen, heat some milk, put some cinnamon in it, and eat a graham cracker. Oh. oh. No, I does love that, graham crackers. <laughs> does that do the trick? No. <laughs> but it just but it, feels good. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a little of the sting out of being up in the middle of the night anyway. <laughs> It's a oh, treat God. for not being yeah, asleep. That's funny. Okay. Do you have a hidden talent? I don't think so. All your talents are <laughs> out there for the world to see. Well, you have plenty of them. So, yes. I mean, yeah. you know, if you had more, we'd have to have a problem yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> okay. How would you describe your fashion sense in a couple of words? Well, I, I think I pay attention to detail. Yeah. You do. I mean, when we were on, we, we were on Zoom yesterday. I mean, you looked amazing. I mean, you, and today too, but you have these great outfits. You have beautiful outfits. Well, color is my thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, well, I like black too, but not beige for me. And yeah. I, I, I just think color uh, and detail. But if you could right. see now how I look, below the waist because my, <laughs> I have a COVID toe. They had to uh, mm-hmm. my uh, cut my shoe, my uh-huh. toes. I mean, please. It's too <laughs> you don't, we don't want it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you look it's great a, from, you know, the yeah. shoulders up. So you're doing all right. Yeah. Oh gosh. Perfect. Uh, okay. What type of music do you enjoy? Well, I, you know, when my husband was very ill, Mm-hmm. And I wanted him at home, and he wanted mm-hmm. to be at home. And he was at ho- in hospice at home for over a year and a half. Wow. So, and every afternoon, by this time, he couldn't watch television, but we would sit. We had a beautiful view, and we would sit at the table looking at the boats, holding hands, and listening to two kinds of music. I told you he was a labor lawyer. So we would le- listen to union songs that are terrific mm-hmm. folk songs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, we'd, and then we'd listen to Frank Sinatra. Aww. So that, that was the two kinds of music that we learned. What a special memory for you. That just, yeah. I can just picture the whole thing. It's, it's That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Really nice. Hopefully you were drinking a glass of wine through all of that too. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> you. That completes the picture right there. Yeah. Okay. What's your idea of fun? Well, that's interesting because I co-lead a group at the Senior Friendship Center. And the topic for next week is fun. Mm. And right now, with the pandemic and what I've been through, I mean, 
I've been trying to make them do for fun because uh, my mobility isn't quite what it was. Right. For me, I think the fun is going to watch a sunset and holding yeah. hands for somebody. Yeah, that is fun. <laughs> it's special. Okay. What is something you hate doing? Well, I've hated cooking. I never cooked. <laughs> <laughs> a woman after my own heart. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Um, Amen time, to that. And with whom I've been involved seems to take over the cooking. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> That's yeah, my awesome. husband's been taking over the cooking. He calls it self-preservation. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that he enjoys it, but he has to eat. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> have you so, ever met a celebrity? Through my husband, many. Yeah? Well, I met Jimmy Carter. I mm. met I didn't really talk to him. I met Ted Kennedy, who uh. was uh, my husband's. At uh, Cesar Chavez. Who, oh, oh. Um, and so I met a lot of celebrities, but did I know them? No, because I met them through Steve. Right. And then the ones that I did know, like Walter Ruther, was fantastic. Mm. Leonard Woodcock, who became the first ambassador to China and president of the UAW. So Really, through Steve and his work, I did meet a lot of wonderful celebrities. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. If I can't talk to somebody, just meeting a celebrity. I know. It's kind of meaningless. Right. It's just right. Not that important. But getting to really know someone, that's, that's the genuine thing. Yeah, I hear that. The people that I did meet and get to know in Washington were a lot of newspaper people who are well known and uh, interesting people and are good friends. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I see. Well, you know, there was two questions I was going to ask you, but I took them off because one I found out in your book um, when you said when you were single and you wanted to start dating again, and you said oh, I, that you weren't going to start cooking and being on the casserole brigade because <laughs> <laughs> you don't like to cook. I decided to go online. Yeah, and that was smart. So you have to write a profile. First of all, for all you did online dating? Yeah. Yeah, she did. Awesome. That's fantastic. I didn't yeah, I know that. It, I, I wouldn't do it again. Well, I don't need to. I have a special friend now. <laughs> I wouldn't be I, I wouldn't do it again because I don't want to criticize men in their nineties, but they're too <laughs> <laughs> too old for you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they can't keep up with you. You needed to go for the 80 year olds. <laughs> so on my profile, I told my age, and then here was my profile: Do not cook, clean, or sew. <laughs> Write books involved in the community. So yeah. what you have to do, and that eliminated a lot of people. And I told you, <laughs> right? I did meet Bon. Uh, through that, and we lived together for five years, and he eventually died of Alzheimer's. But I, as I say, I wouldn't do it again because I really am too old to go online. But again, I don't need to go online right now. I know mm. I meet people just by meeting them. Right, right. I can imagine. Well, you're a charming person, and people are automatically drawn to you, I'm sure. <laughs> Oh my gosh, we were so excited to meet you. And we feel like we've met a celebrity now. So and as you said, you know, wanting to talk with one is even better. So we're so thankful and so grateful that you took the time to come on with us. And especially after just battling COVID and uh, everything else. But thank you so much. Amazing that you were able to na navigate all this technology that we uh, require uh, to do a podcast. So amazing. Uh, can I right. ask you something? Or of I can course. Ask this afterwards if you need to. No, go ahead. I think my kids would get a kick out of seeing this. Of mm. course. How cool is it to see it? We Definitely. will be happy to send it to them. Yep. We can send yeah. it to you and, yeah, you know, and share you it can with forward them. it to them. Yep. Yep. Like, it's going to, it's because it's a video, it'll be a big file. So we'll put it on like a Google Drive and. 
share it that you, way or you might need to bring your tech person in. Yeah, bring your tech <laughs> guy in. Friend now. But here, here is, uh, here's what's happening to me. Many people, well, my children and people like that close to, want me to write a memoir. I'm not, in, I can't do it. I'm, mm. as I wanted to write something, it would be something that could be a, I don't know, it wouldn't be a memoir. And yet I know that there are stories that I've told you and I'm being interviewed in a couple of weeks by another, well, two more interviews by two different groups. And I think I don't need to write a memoir if I can give you, yeah. yes. tell stories. Share your story. And I'm happy to share my stories, but I cannot picture spending the time. I mean, and I think it's important, but I don't know why I can't do it. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot, well, it's a lot of work and <laughs> it's a yeah. lot of time. I mean, I'm right now interested in a new project and I'd rather spend my time on that. Mm -hmm. What is and this that, new project? That's a new project. Well, it's not a project, but because I have had COVID mm -hmm. and pneumonia and I've been very sick, they told my kids that I would die in the hospital, but mm -hmm. I did so because I, my strength Gosh. is sapped, although I'm feeling better and better every day, I have help every morning. Mm -hmm. So I shower and get dressed. Well, the help that I've had are not educated. And many from a foreign country, two I'm thinking of, they have dreams of becoming a massage therapist, a nurse. They don't have, their high school education is not honored in this country. They have tried for the GED, but they, and they've even taken courses, but the courses will say free. And then you fill out a form and it's a thousand dollars, or they went to a course and they were sat with a computer and a person left. They don't get, if my child, and I've, one of my children, I mean, I've, dealt with learning disabilities in my family. What do I do? I find resources, I'm able to pay resources. Right, I know. They have dreams, but they can't hire, they don't have the money to hire a coach, a counselor, the whole GED thing. It's like they have dreams, but they have roadblocks. And that is just so upsetting to me. I have no yeah. idea that if you wanted to take a GED, but you didn't have money or a lot of education, you're not going to get the kind of coach and support that you need, that my child would get, that your child would get. And this is beginning. And, and so I i don't know what I'm going to do about it, but I know I have to do something. Oh, my, oh gosh. my gosh. This is such an important issue for me as well. My idea is that the government should sponsor a program, a bridge between counselors and the people that need us the most. Yes. Because, you know, counselors, uh, coaches, career coaches cannot work for free. We're trying to make uh, survive as well out here. But right. the people we need the, that need us the most are unable. They don't have access to us. So if there was some sort of bridge. How do I want to spend? And I don't know what I'll do about that, if anything. But I know that I can't spend my last years writing about myself. I love being interviewed like this. Yeah. And, but I need to get my teeth in a project. So this is one that's really just, I mean, just because of my need of having the kind of help that I have, uh, that, that I'm learning. Open your eyes. Open yeah. your eyes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I love that you're out there still fighting and trying to make things happen, change the world into a better place. Well, we appreciate your selecting me to interview. I really do. Oh, we're honored to have you, Nancy, and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thanks Bye -bye. again for coming on. Take care. So just want to once again, thank Dr. Nancy Schlossberg for coming on our podcast. We were so honored and excited to have her and she is amazing and wonderful and what a legacy she has left behind and still more to come. 
Yeah, she's not done. That's for sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, she is not done. She's a continuer, like she says. Although you know, now she's searching, so she's a searcher. But, <laughs> but honestly, I mean, who doesn't want to be the easy glider, right? So, right. Nancy has so many good stories. She, I mean, at 92 years of really living life, she's got one story after another, and. I don't know. She's a great storyteller, obviously a, a wonderful person, and we were lucky to have her on. But anyway, while we have you here, thank you all for listening. We really appreciate you coming back, or if it's your first time, welcome. Thanks for being here. As always, it really helps us if you subscribe to our podcast. Also, rate, review, any one of those three things, all three of those things, anything like that really helps us out a lot. Absolutely. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And thank you once again, Dr. Nancy Schlossberg. Have a great day, everyone. Have a great day. And this has been an Academic and Career Advising Services production.